Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Alex Wolf and Gavin Shaw here, and we are breaking down some other non Knicks trade news that also affects the Knicks that went down today. Drew Holiday going to the Celtics. We'll break down what that means for the Celtics, how it places them against the Knicks. Did this just kind of kill the Knicks' chances for a little while? Are the Celtics the new favorites, even though we just said the Bucks were a couple days ago in the East? Does this put the screws to the Knicks to have to make a move sooner rather than later with this arms race going on? And then we'll end the show off with a little media day talk, trying to make some predictions of things we want to see at media day today, which if you're not aware is today. So that's all coming up right now on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. And we want to remind you guys that today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. And we want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notifications bell on YouTube. So you never miss an episode. We're here for you guys five times a week because the Knicks are about to start back up five times a week, baby. And if that's not enough for you and you want to talk with us more, you can check us out on subtext, which is a new platform where you can talk with us all the time with the season coming up. We'll use that as our sounding board for thoughts during and after games and all that good stuff. So if you're interested in that and you can do it right from the text messaging app on your phone, you can uh, check that out in the episode description. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor in chief of Nick's site, The Strickland, which you can find at the Strick.land. And he's Gavin Shaw, your favorite play by play broadcaster's favorite play by play broadcaster. And this is the Drew Holiday trade episode. Uh, Gavin, Drew Holiday ends up going to the Celtics, which was, I don't know about unexpected, but yeah. m- maybe not. I, I don't know that I fully thought that it was going to happen. Uh, he ends up. Going there for especially for what they gave up. This is this is what is really intriguing to me. I because when I was just talking to John Corrales last week, he was talking about like Robert Williams was figuring to be a pretty big part of what they were going to do. Where uh, there was, I saw an article or or an excerpt from a podcast recently that like NBA execs this off season are actually sort of taking notes from the Knicks for once uh, and are putting an emphasis on offensive rebounding this off season and stuff like that. And yet the Celtics just traded away Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon, the wrongful six man of the year from last year uh, for Drew Holiday, which I think makes them a good deal better in the spot that Brogdon occupied. And yet also maybe creates some new issues where the fact that like these guys now have a big man rotation of Kristaps Porzingis, Al Horford, who's getting up there in age and uh, uh, Luke Cornett, Nick legend. That's like their big man rotation now. I don't know what what's your what's your takeaway from from all this, uh, especially given that they also lost Grant Williams this offseason. Like it seems like they've kind of, in an effort to get better, have almost deprioritized their bigs a little bit much to me. Yeah, I I, I don't I can't help but think this makes them the Bucks and the Nuggets in their own tier in the NBA it makes them co favorites in the East. I would honestly probably lean towards making them the favorite in the Eastern conference at this point. I mean, we we talked about, and and, and you you got a chance to talk about with John, everything that Marcus smart brought to the team. And I was listening to the episode as a, as a Celtics hater, I I was salivating a little bit because I was, he he was talking about everything Marcus smart obviously brought as a leader, as kind of the emotional center of that team as as easily their best passer. And I, I think if there was, if there was one thing that people were maybe overlooking in terms of the Celtics being sneakily worse than last year, despite getting a really good player in Chris Stapps Porzingis, it was the fact that, like, who who's the connector there? Who Who's the guy who bridges the gap between Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, who are both awesome, but Brown in particular, kind of a head-down guy, kind, kind of a pure scorer. Um, and, and if there wasn't really that connective tissue to their offense, could they be as dominant on that end of the floor as they've been the last few years that's kind of defined both their regular season and postseason success by and large? Um, and would it amplify some of the issues they had in the postseason? Now they get an even better version of Marcus Smart, a guy who can create his own shot far better, um, is an even better shooter, was 45% on spot-up threes last year, uh, was 39% as a three-point shooter overall. So that is an upgrade. Um, I think Brogdon's a big loss. 
I think Time Lord's a big loss, Alex. I'll, I'll let you get into that in just a sec. But before we do, I, I was curious what your take on this was from a Knicks perspective, because obviously the Knicks were bandied about. We, we mentioned on this podcast as a team that could potentially trade for Drew in their own right. Um, we we kind of noted that it didn't really make a ton of sense for them to do so. And, and probably the only realistic guy that could be dealt out in such a deal would have been R.J. Barrett. And who knows if the Knicks are willing to do that? Who knows if Portland even valued him as a player? But what, what were kind of your thoughts after seeing the package on the Knicks not being able to go get him? Yeah, I, I don't know, because it's it's hard to put together like an analogous offer that the Knicks could have thrown out there just due to salaries and, and that sort of stuff. Like, you know, we just saw the random one-off line from Vince Goodwill this week about like, oh, the and – you know, the Knicks value Mitchell Robinson as being worth like multiple first round picks. It was just sort of a weird line to throw in there of like, it was about DeAndre Ayton in the article. And it was just kind of like a, as a means to show like what the cost is to upgrade your center in the league right now. And yet also it was like, well, why would that even be out there? You know, unless that's something that's been talked about at some point or another. Um, And so like that kind of, made me think, okay, well, was maybe the reason for that, that the Knicks made an offer for Drew and were willing to throw Mitchell Robinson into the fold, which would just be a bizarre combo, Mitch and DeAndre Ayton. I mean, it seems like they want to roll with Robert Williams and DeAndre Ayton, which I think is also bizarre, but, uh, you know, to each their own. I just, I, I guess from a Knicks perspective, it would have been like Mitch and quickly. I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what your – what your offer looks like in that case, but that doesn't even make the money totally work. You know, maybe Mitch quickly Fournier or something like, but I don't, I don't know that the Knicks would have done that because I think they would look at quickly and be like, well, if this guy keeps developing the way that he has been, he'll just be a younger version of drew holiday like this year. Uh, so I, it didn't upset me too much, you know, especially once I saw the price, I, I will say like from a pick compensation perspective, they got a pretty sweet deal, like only giving up the warriors pick this coming year, which, the Warriors still, you know, Steph Curry is still on the team and they have made some improvements over the offseason. Like, I think they'll still be solidly a playoff team. So that's not going to be like a super high valued pick. And then their own pick in 2029, like that's not that's not a huge pick compensation. Uh, and then like Brogdon, I, I think the big piece here is Time Lord. Like, I don't know. I, I just find myself I find myself not being envious of this particular deal. Uh, or like envious that the Knicks didn't do it. Um, and yet, you know, which we'll talk about as, as well as the Robert Williams stuff, but like, we'll talk about it in the next segment. I'm sure like, I, I do wonder if this puts the screws to the Knicks to get better sooner than later though. Uh, just because the, the East now at the top is just unbelievably stacked. Um, and it, it seems like there's more opportunities to potentially get more stacked in the, you know, coming months or so. Uh, if certain players become available and if certain Western Western conference teams, you know, are willing to send more players to the East, like we're sort of seeing a power dynamic shift and that's going to make life pretty rough on the Knicks uh, going forward if they want to keep getting better. Yeah. Look, I mean, the, it's the Celtics in some ways baking in even, even more risk, right? Because I just, I talked about how they upgraded for Marcus smart, but you also lose Malcolm Brogdon. So that that's a two for one in its own way. You, you drop Robert Williams, who was, I, I think people forget because it feels like a, a different lifetime now, but during that 21, 22 season, when they became great, it was because Ime Udoka inserted him as, as basically like a roving fly swatter around the rim on the back end of that zone and just said, Hey, like we're going to essentially have you guarding the worst shooter on the other team. Doesn't really matter what the position is. And you are just going to hover outside the paint. Whenever anyone comes in, you're going to come sprinting over and you're going to destroy everything at the rim. And, and the Celtics again, were, were dominant that year and took golden state to, six games despite Jason Tatum um, kind of puckering up a little bit in the biggest moments um, because of that incredible defensive identity. And, and it, it's weird to say that in, in trading for Drew Holiday, that they're, they're not totally they, I, I think they're trying to make up for some of those losses to some extent. I wonder if he can cover up all that. We saw Marcus Smart certainly couldn't last year and then an injury to him and, and, and their depth is really, really in question, but what what they currently have as a starting lineup, um, whether they go big with Horford and KP or it's small and it's white, um, Drew Holiday, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and Porzingis. I mean that I I don't think despite everything we said about the Bucks, despite everything you have to respect w- with Denver's continuity, it, it's hard to look at that and say there's a better 
two-way lineup in the NBA. If KP can play how he played last year, we'll get into some of the numbers in just a bit, but he actually did a lot of the same things that Robert Williams does well and did some of them even better than Robert Williams does. So I, I think there's a lot of reasons to look at this trade and say the Celtics unquestionably got better for today. They open up some questions about their future, but they are going to be really, really good next year. It's going to be interesting to see, to your point, Alex, how that affects the Knicks' thinking. But if you're like me, maybe your first thought in all of this was – when do I get to watch the Knicks and Celtics play? Well, you have two great options. They play the very first game of the preseason, which Alex, man, I saw this and my eyes lit up. Uh, not that far away. It is six days from, or, sorry, it's, it's a week away from today uh, when you're listening to this episode on Monday. So that's pretty incredible. Um, or you could see it October 25th, but how would you go about seeing it? That's easy. There's only one place to go. It is game time. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. I, I've had so many moments where I've wanted to go to Knicks games, and, I, and I'll look, and, and it'll just be too expensive. But then sometimes it gets to about an hour before the game. I, I'm lucky enough to be just 17 blocks away from Madison Square Garden. Um, and I'm like, you know what? I, I just got to do it. And, and nothing replicates the experience on game time of buying a last second ticket. because they, You see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you get there. And all-in prices, this is my favorite part, show your total up front so you know you're getting a great deal without hidden fees and you can buy tickets in just two taps so it doesn't take an hour when you're rushing to try to get to games. And the game time guarantee means you'll always have the best price if you find tickets in the same section row for less. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app. Create an account and use code Locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All righty. Um, Alex, uh, you brought this up. So I want to get your opinion on it first. Does this create a greater sense of urgency for the Knicks to keep up with the Joneses? Or does this push them the opposite way and say, hey, maybe before Milwaukee made their all move, before Boston made their all move, Maybe we had a puncher's chance of winning the Eastern Conference. Now, these two teams are in a different stratosphere, even if there's a catastrophic injury or, or just chemistry occurrence for one of them. The other one's still going to be there. We don't really have a shot this year. Let's just ride things up, ride things out. Let's not try to use any of our pick capital. Let's not try to trade any of our young guns, and let's wait for this offseason to make meaningful improvements. Yeah, I'm kind of the of the opinion that I think it's probably going to force their hand a little bit. Um I think they'll still try to wait for the right deal. And luckily, I think the star market is resetting in a very positive way. Like I saw something really comical about like, look at what the look at what like the Bucks just traded to get Dane Lillard. And then look at what Rudy Gobert went for last year. Yeah. You know, like it's it, deals are coming down. It's like the housing market right now. You know what I mean? Like last year was like was like the housing market during COVID. And then now we're seeing it kind of like come back to earth a little bit. Um you know, I, I think that the Knicks will start looking. I mean, I, it, there's going to be a lot of factors at play. I do think, I mean, I talked about this with with Evan from Locked on Cavs this past week. Like, I think Donovan Mitchell is a guy that they're going to keep an eye on. I think Joel Embiid is a guy they're going to keep an eye on out of Philly. It, that particular trade, the Joel Embiid one, I think would be a lot harder to pull off. They definitely have to pay like an in-division tax, which would probably force their hand to say no. Because the Knicks just have shown under the Leon Rose regime that they're not willing to go that extra mile and give that extra, you know, two pick, two picks, extra player, you know, whatever. We, we have not seen anything happen like the Mellow trade, for example, where the Knicks just kept getting asked like, OK, but now give us this guy and OK, but now give us this guy, too. And, you know, there's there's been none of that um, in the Leon Rose era. For that reason, I think it might become more realistic that they would go after someone like Mitchell. I, I think the big thing, though, is that it's just going to hinge on how well are they playing to start the year. Does it look like they're clearly overmatched by these these more like powerhouse teams? And, you know, do they th or do, do they play them close enough that you say, you know what, you make that one meaningful upgrade. We're right there with these guys like Jalen Brunson is this good. Julius Randle is this good. You know, our, our overall team structure is this good that we can we can make ourselves demonstrably better if we make that big move. Um, but on the flip side, there's also a world where 
the Knicks don't start off well, and then they feel the pressure to catch up because it's like, well, we were the five seed last year, made the second round, and now we're tracking towards like the seven or eight seed, and that's unacceptable because we want to keep getting better. There's a, there's a lot of – basically, there's a lot of roads and a lot of paths to think ago. If this was like – um like on the Marvel show Loki where the timeline yeah, breaks. Figure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where the timeline yeah. breaks and it just turns into like this giant lightning bolt of various, you know, options going out into the world of different timelines. I think a lot of the timelines are going to lead to good or bad for the Knicks this year, them feeling the pressure to get better uh, at some point in the future, whether it's to catch back up to where they were in their standing in the conference or to catch like to make that move that puts them in the same stratosphere as these like super teams now. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm with you. I, I still I still think Embiid. I mean, especially with with everything that's happened with the Bucks, is going to be the name to watch. And and this trade right only serves to drive that home to him because like who was the most urgent team to get Drew Holiday? And honestly, it was despite all the jokes and all the laughs we've had at their expense, it was not the Miami Heat. Um, despite all the failures Boston has had in the playoffs throughout the entire Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown era. And I say that as a relative term because they're always making the conference finals and, and once making the finals and, and just not quite getting over the over the edge. They weren't the most desperate team because they have those two guys under contract for the foreseeable future. The most desperate team is clearly the Philadelphia 76ers, right, who are in the midst of a disaster of epic proportions um, with the James Harden situation. And Embiid, like, it just feels like a ticking time bomb as, as to when he's going to look at that and say, hey, this is totally untenable. It feels like this season is going to be one of the more miserable in the history of the NBA for a team that will probably still find a way to win 50 games. Like, it's it just going to suck there. And, and I think it right now, unless, until Daryl Morey pulls a rabbit out of his hat, it's looking like if or it's looking like win more than if in terms of Joel Embiid asking out. And, and I, I hear you on Leon Rose in the past, not being willing to go all in. I think given Joel Embiid's resume relative to someone like Donovan Mitchell, I think we're going to see him go all in. Whether that's the right move or not, Like I, I think we've both posted some questions. A lot of other really smart people have posted some questions about Joel Embiid, what he can do in the playoffs, how he's going to age into his 30s, that you got to think about. But I think the Knicks will ultimately do it. And if that happens it's an arms race, right? Like, like, does that, like, like if you just added MB to the roster and you somehow magically didn't take a lot off for the Knicks, would they be better than the Bucks and the Celtics? They would be in that conversation for sure, but that's kind of the challenge. You got to be in it to win it. So I, I'm curious to see what the Knicks do going forward. And I, I'm curious to see from Boston's perspective, how this affects things. Because Alex, I, I wrote down some of the numbers in the doc, but it, it's pretty interesting. Like on, on paper, I was like, all right, like, does Boston have any weaknesses outside of the fact that they could, KP could get hurt and, and they're screwed over with their bigs? And like, honestly, like I think rebounding is going to be a bit of a problem for them, but KP was in some ways a better rim protector than Time Lord was a year ago. So I, I don't know. I, I, th I think there are things that the Knicks can take advantage of there, but I, I just still think Boston's in a different class. I do think that the biggest thing, and I mean, this was something that Corrales and I talked about it, with regards to the Celtics is that, their identity has kind of changed now and they're not the gritty team that they once were, which was an identity that was, you know, built under Udoka with, you know, with Robert Williams, with Marcus Smart, uh, you know, and, and all these guys that were, you know, really, really good on defense that then, you know, gave you uh, that intensity on that end. So that then, you know, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and them could do their thing on the other end. You, you don't think Drew can single-handedly bring that as like the guy who's like considered by NBA players the best defender in the league? Because I, and I'm not I'm not asking that like a rhetorical way. Like I'm yeah. I'm not sure. That's kind of what I'm curious about with them. Like, is he enough by himself? I think he can bring that to the perimeter for sure. I I think the biggest thing is going to be the rebounding, though. I just I don't think that team rebounds well. You know, it's going to be Porzingis and Horford presumably, and then you know maybe you're slotting Tatum. Uh, yeah, I guess Tatum down to the four from time to time. I mean, they ran some sort of like weird looks where like Derek White was like sort of like swinging around like the, you know, like two to four, like guarding people, whatever, sort of playing the smart role uh, before. And I think he had some like kind of absurd like block numbers and stuff for a guy his size. Yeah. Um, but either way, I just don't I don't really see it. I, I, you know, Porzingis has gotten a lot better as a rebounder, but like Horford's never been at least not in the past number of years, like a mega dominant rebounder. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I do think that's going to harm them. I think in matchups specifically with the Knicks, 
the Knicks will find some of the same success that they have been able to find against the Celtics because they're still going to out rebound the crap out of them. Uh, other teams maybe won't have that same advantage, but that's certainly something that the Knicks put a large emphasis on. And I think will really help them against the Celtics this year and beyond. But um, I guess we'll see how that all goes ultimately. Uh, and I guess the best place to start is when we get to media day, which is today where all good things start with the season. So why don't we take our last break and then we'll come back in and we'll go over some media day. Uh, let's just call it wish list. We'll call it our wish list. What we want to see at media day, what we're hoping to see discussed and uh, what we're hoping to get some answers on. So that's coming up next. All right. We're back in to talk about media day now, Gavin. Uh, today is media day, which means it was just the unofficial start of the season. You know, you could say the first preseason game is kind of more that, but uh, this is the first time where we get to see the entire team in uniform, get to hear them talk to reporters, uh, and, you know, just kind of get a feel for what the Knicks have been working on this offseason and what they're looking to accomplish this season. What's sort of the first thing on your wish list that you want to see out of training camp today? I think or, I'm sorry, just... the media day, I should say. Yeah, right. well, well both. The but, opening um, of yeah. training camp, media day. But Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think it's honestly like where Emmanuel Quickly's head at head is that like is there he would be i mean similar to obi top and when obi wasn't playing last year obviously this is a different issue but those guys have always been very reticent to make negative comments and essentially like outside of like that one weird obi thing last year that kind of like sort of leaked um like never really made bad comments about the knicks like do we get our first one ever from emmanuel quickly and is he just super frustrated about not getting a new deal and he says yeah you know like if things don't work out. I'm gonna have to play somewhere else because I I think like I'm ready to be an all star guard in the league and I and I love New York and I'm gonna I'm gonna show that this season and you're gonna see me better than ever and and man I hope I hope Leon and company respect that and and see that like I just I don't think that's who quickly is so I, I don't think that's gonna happen I don't think that's gonna come out I think if that ever did happen it would probably leak from his agents and would be more of an anonymous report type deal but I, I'm I'm just really fascinated to see where he's at because we, we we talked about this summer maybe we didn't talk about it enough this summer like. Like the dude was incredible last year. And and I think if he had carried over his regular season play into the playoffs, the Knicks, the Knicks would have paid him and, and said like re financial repercussions down the road, be damned. We'll figure it out. Like maybe we have to trade him. Maybe we have to trade someone else. But we're going to lock this guy down. And I, I think what happened, and again, what was ultimately just six or so playoff games for him, planted this small seed of doubt in the Knicks front office and, and, and quickly was saying like, hey, like pay me based on what I did in the regular season. They said, well, you were this in the playoffs. Like you didn't show us anything there. Um, and, and that's been the ongoing gap there, I would think. So I wonder, I wonder like what his initial thoughts are on all that. Yeah. I'm definitely intrigued to hear from quick too, you know, and I'm sure his contract will come up. So I'm kind of curious to hear what his, I'm sure he'll be diplomatic about it. He'll probably just play the, that's between my agent and, yeah and Leon card, you know, and just be like, I'm not worried about that yet. You know, we'll do what we do. You know, like if, if I get a new deal, I get a new deal. If not, I'll play this season gladly. And, you know, prove what I'm worth next year or something. Um, so maybe that comes out. I, I think one thing that I'm looking forward to seeing is in Tibbs's presser, I am very curious to hear if he gets asked point blank because we've only seen this in like rumors and like Ian Begley reports of like, these are, this is what people in the Knicks are saying, you know, like this is what they're thinking. But the one thing I want to hear out of Tibbs's mouth is, I'm comfortable with Josh Hart being my backup for this year. Uh, I think that he he mentioned Hart being able to play the four in spots uh, from almost the second that Hart arrived with the team last year. It, like he brought that up, you know, very first game after, you know, Hart debuted, I think was when he got asked about that or, or perhaps like right before Hart's debut or something along those lines. And he like unprompted kind of said that right away. Like, oh, we can maybe see him playing the four a little bit which is sort of shocking because it just doesn't seem to fit Tibbs's MO. So I, I am really curious to hear him like say that out loud and say, yes, I, I think that Josh Hart's going to be our uh, more or less our full-time backup for this year based off roster construction. And I'd be curious to hear if anyone asks him also like, so are you willing to say that like, you're not going to play like Jericho Sims or Isaiah Hardenstein there uh, from time to time, like to supplement that because I do get the feeling we might see those lineups at some point. 
And I don't know how comfortable I would be with that if I'm being completely honest. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes, but that's, that's definitely something I'm like looking forward to hearing out of tips of mouth. The East is big, man. East yeah. Big. <laughs> He'll yeah. channel his Mike Woodson. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be ready for it. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that as well. And I think it's going to be painful for Tibbs because I think he knows that, that Leon Rose maybe ingeniously made it. So that's literally essentially his only option um, unless he really wants to be a, a jerk. I, I want to use another word there. And, and to your point, just throw out those ugly, ugly lineups that somehow spurred the Knicks eight game winning streak last year, where we got a whole lot of Hartenstein and Sims um, at the same time, but man, oh man, that that's going to be, that's going to be interesting. Um, I'm excited to hear from Dante DiVincenzo for the first time as a Nick. Like not again, not expecting any fireworks there, but just, just going to be cool to see him in the building. I'm um, hearing from him. Um, the other guy who, who's just kind of like I, I want a temperature check from is Julius Randle. Um, coming off that great season and that pretty horrid playoffs, like and and last year we we kind of heard all the right things from him in the beginning of the season, like say, hey, it was the best season of my career or best off season of my career. Like I, I know the things that went really wrong last year. Like I've taken a like breathing techniques and meditation and I'm in a different place. And for the most part, again, that there were, there were some, some dead spots early in this season, but for the most part translated pretty well resulted in a career year for Julius. I, I kind of just want to hear all the same things again and want to hear that he's excited. I don't really expect to hear anything less than that. Um, kind of the same deal with RJ Barrett. And, and then final thing for me, just any, any, any Mitchell Robinson quote, just give me all of it. And, and any, any moment of Tibbs being Tibbs, Alex, like it's going to wear me down probably 20 games into the year at this point, but we, we had a five month off season. It's been a really long time. So I'm, I'm excited just, just to get back into the swing of things. Yeah. It does in a way sort of remind of like, you know, like having friends that you don't see for a long time and then all of a sudden you reconnect and then you're like, Oh man, I remember how this is. And, you know, so yeah, Mitch, Mitch definitely is one of those. He's, he's probably the guy I've got the, the biggest like parasocial relationship with on the team where I'm just like, I, I wish he had a subtext. Honestly. Yeah. It would be pretty sick. Yeah. Subtext or, or just give him, bring back Mitch's block party. That would be the best possible uh, announcement that they can make at media day. Like, by the way, the block party's coming back and Mitch's little, Mitch's little talk show is coming back where he just acts like a clown and <laughs> like, it awkwardly interviews his teammates. It was just so funny the first like two seasons he was with the Knicks. So hopefully we get that back on MSG. Um, yeah, I, I, Tibbs too. Tibbs is always endearing for the first like couple weeks, uh, and then you know the the worst parts of his interview style and everything start to get a little grating. But it, at the beginning, his gruffness and his uh, inability to or is, is reluctance to change and all that stuff is always sort of weirdly endearing so i look forward to the the early season honeymoon phase with that uh, i'm with you too though with julius and rj i don't expect julius to say anything that's not uh, that's not the pr friendly you know response to anything but you know i am curious to hear how the rehab went with his ankle and how confident he feels with that you know it seemed like it was more just a cleaning and doing doing a procedure to sort of like ensure the proper healing of those ligaments that were like really messed up after he sprained his ankle so bad twice in a row. But I still want to hear, you know, like, Hey, I'm pain free. I'm ready to go. You know, I've been, I've been in my normal routine now and I, and I I'm in the best shape of my life again. And I feel like I'm ready to rock and, and get into this season. Uh, I'm kind of curious from RJ's perspective, if he gets asked how his FIBA world cup has affected him, uh, you know, and if he feels more ready for the season and, uh, you know, having sort of an alpha role, like if there's anything that he that he took from that, you know, the the time with Team Canada that he hopes to bring to uh, the Knicks this year. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, I would love to hear what Jalen Brunson's been working on, too. I'm looking forward to hearing him again. Actually, I'm really looking forward to the inevitable triple Villanova press conference where they're going to they're I, I hope at least that they quickly overlap uh Brunson, DiVincenzo and Hart's time because they're really funny together. So that would make for a fun moment too. Um yeah. Yeah. But overall, just kind of excited to see these guys in their uniforms and talk about how ready they are to get to work and then get to work and then hopefully we'll have a fun season again. Yeah, some some Quentin Grimes insight onto how the training with JJ Reddick uh 
went would, would be really cool too because I saw, I saw more videos of that today and it seems like that's been an ongoing thing throughout the summer and has me really excited that my only fear is like all right Tibbs actually has to use the stuff he's learning and, and run him off the screens and, and and let him uh like catch one dribble shoot sometime and, and let, let him take some mid-range shots because it seems like he can make them but anyways that's that's a conversation for another day uh we'll be back throughout the rest of the week uh plenty of individual player previews have some exciting guests coming on um maybe we'll talk you through a couple other teams indiana pacers miami heat um, on the dock with that and who knows Alex, the way things are going we'll maybe have one more crazy trade to discuss before the season starts but until then he's alex i'm gavin we'll talk to you soon on locked on Knicks.